The 16th and 17th century were times of great wealth, but also extreme poverty and unease. Covering a period which included the civil war between 1642 and 1649 and the Great Plague of 1665, which saw 100,000 people die, this was a period of huge change. During this time, the population increased from approximately 150,000 in 1580 to 500,000 in 1660. And overcrowding, poor sanitation and disease increased and crime and begging became rampant. The rich and poor inhabitants began to live in separate areas and the rich started to move towards the west of the city walls, which at the time was open and spacious countryside. This was also the period theatres began to be established, which clashed with religious doctrines of the time and saw them initially placed along the other side of the river on the Southwark side, so they would be outside the restriction of the laws within the walls of the city. And then, in 1666, disaster struck again. Previous exhibitions include Cheapside Horde, Crime Uncovered and Sherlock Holmes. One of the most popular exhibitions was that of the Great Fire of London of 1666. The fantastic display brings the terrifying events to life. Over 350 years ago, the Great Fire began in London and devastated the capital. Thomas Farriner closed his bakery on the 1st of September 1666. He said his oven was out by 10 p.m. that evening. He lived above the bakery with his daughter Hannah, a maid and a manservant. During the early hours of Sunday morning on the 2nd of September, the manservant awoke to find the building full of smoke. Like many houses in London, the bakery in Pudding Lane was probably timber framed and very close to the houses on either side. At the height of the fire, the temperature reached over 1200 degrees Celsius. We know this from the remains of melted items that were later uncovered. These can be seen on display. When the Great Fire started, there was a storm with very strong winds blowing, which culminated in the flames spreading. The parish constables were called and in turn summoned the Lord Mayor, Sir Thomas Bloodworth. Apparently, the Mayor was reluctant to order the pulling down of houses without the permission of the owners, as the person pulling them down would have been liable to pay for their rebuilding. Strong winds, combined with timber frame buildings and with no fire brigade to call, meant the fire spread rapidly. There were procedures to deal with fires, but these proved wholly inadequate. The nearby houses were evacuated and the church bells were rung backwards, which reversed the common order of chimes, signalling alarm or danger. There was a plan where all streets and lanes between the fire and any water sources, such as the river, were to be manned by double rows of local people, forming a human chain passing buckets to collect the water. Although there were fire engines available, each engine required several people to operate the equipment and horses to move them. In the very narrow streets amongst general panic, these were impractical, and ineffective against the fire. Finally, King Charles II ordered houses to be pulled down, which at the time was a bold decision. At this point, the fire had been burning for over 10 hours and had destroyed nearly a 1,000 homes. The king appointed his brother, the Duke of York, to take charge of the firefighting efforts. By Monday, the efforts to control the Great Fire were becoming more organised, with the Duke of York setting up command posts with firefighters all around the perimeter. However, once the fire had crossed both Cheapside and the Fleet River, it was inevitable that St Paul's would be the next to succumb. Much as it is today, St Paul's was a revered landmark. 
With the fire still out of control, by Tuesday, flames began to appear on the roof at around 8 p.m. Rumours soon began to spread that the fire was not an accident and was an act of foreign terrorism. It was thought to be revenge for an attack two weeks earlier by Sir Robert Holmes in the Dutch town of West Terschelling, where he had set fire to a fleet of 140 ships. Frenchman Robert Hubert confessed to starting the fire, and despite his confession not corresponding properly with the events, he was tried, found guilty and hanged. After his death, it was actually discovered that Hubert arrived in London two days into the fire. Thomas Farriner and his family, in whose bakery the fire is thought to have started, signed the True Bill, which condemned Hubert to death. Other rumours were that the fire was a papist plot or a punishment sent by God for the behaviour of sinful Londoners. High up on Cock Lane in Smithfield Market is a small gold statue known as the Golden Boy of Pie Corner. This statue represents the sin of gluttony and the plaque located underneath it explains this. Many people thought the fire was brought about by the sin of gluttony as the fire started at Pudding Lane and ended at Pie Corner. The Great Fire lasted five days and resulted in up to 100,000 people losing their homes and 87 churches were either destroyed or badly damaged. Remarkably, very few deaths are recorded. The rebuilding of London lasted over 40 years. Later, a monument to the Great Fire of London was built, designed by Sir Christopher Wren. It stands at 61 metres high. This represents the distance from the monument to Pudding Lane where the Great Fire of London started.